picture. All right, welcome back. So thanks for the individual presentations of our crew here in the room as well as in the virtual space. Um, part of me wants to just sit back and let you all talk to one another <laughs> uh, because I think it would be a fascinating discussion. So if we have a little time, maybe, uh, maybe we'll get there. Um, but I, I wanted to start with uh, what I think could be a short one. Um, we, well, I'm going to say it this way. Let's make it a short one <laughs> because I'm sure we could go on and on on this one. But who are you primarily doing your work for? So is it for are you, when, you, when, you do, when you're designing your software or when you're doing most of your work in your practice, are you primarily working for the large architecture firm? That's one option. The small architecture firm, the engineering or researchers you know, of the world, or the, the owner. Uh, and I realize that, of course, the answer is all of them. But if you have to say, where, where in, you know, what is the primary motivator and how you do what you do? I would love to, to give everyone the chance to, to sort of answer it with the brief answer and maybe one sentence, but no more. I have a short answer. All right. It's none of them. It's maybe the end user of the building in the first place. OK. But to do so to all of them at the same time, yep. so architects, developers, and it will maybe differ also in different countries, in different industry, in we, who, how the, the roles are divided and who owns who in the process. Mm -hmm. who, who else wants to jump in? <laughs> yeah, uh, I can continue. I think I mainly focus on uh, how the architect uh, will interpret the results. Because in a way, I feel that uh, they're sort of the best machine learning uh, algorithm you can get to in the office. Mm -hmm. So I try to format the data for them. And do you think there's a meaningful characterization between smaller firm and larger firm in terms of capacity or uh, just the amount of maybe individual personnel that they may have dedicated to the project? Yeah, I think that is changing. I'm working at like a medium-sized architecture firm. Uh, beforehand, we only saw the really big guys uh, have uh, the money to afford us engineers. Uh, but as we also... Um, can become more useful in the design phase, we sort of find us ourselves. So I think it's getting a change that it will add value at any size of firm. Mikael? Yeah, well, I want to uh, say the same thing as uh, France. In the end, it's the end users uh, that, we, that we care about. Of course, we have to go through the architects, at least in, in my company, uh, to achieve that. But uh, yeah, mm. it's, it's definitely the, the end clients. All right, and how about Alston and Stefan? Maybe Alston first. Oh yeah, well um, at at Solima, our, our goal is for all architecture firms to be able to do to do these kinds of analyses. But in in my in my research life, um, I, I realized that some of the things that we're starting to calculate are not the greatest things to communicate to to designers. And so I think uh, that part is a bit more mixed for me, <laughs> if uh, if I was to say so, because I, I hope someone will figure out how to take um, some of the calculations that, that we're putting on you know, GitHub or whatever and make it useful. <laughs> Good. And Stefan? Um, yeah, I, I think my target audience would be my co-presenters today, <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, <laughs> that um, as sort of a former daylight simulation lighting designer, architect, consultant, um, I'm now kind of working on the projects that I wish, or working on the tools that I wish existed for me when I was in that practice. So I'm hoping that other people can now find those uh, useful. But yeah, it's not direct to client by any. I, I, I have to jump in here. And um, if you don't yeah. mind, dovetail on what you were saying. When you say end user, that sounds great, but please, the end users are not going to go to the computer and they're not going to simula simulate daylight. So th that, that I think is an extremely positive value. But my question would be, do you hope that the workflow processes that are used, the traditional linear ones of architect, engineer, landscape, construction manager, construction, et cetera, do you hope that that changes? And if so, how would you change it? Well, I would say that hopefully these tools that we've presented today can enable this, uh, this change. Uh, and then we can float better together and work better together, all of us, engineers, architects, uh, yeah, constructing architects and so on, uh, hopefully. Yeah. 
do you think we'll still make the separation, engineers, architects, we'll etc.? We'll definitely still have the separation, but if we can limit the gap and make sure that the architects are informed from the very beginning about how they design, then uh, I think that will also make life better for the engineers. Then they don't have to see a project where they have to change everything. They actually have to validate the results and maybe use their, their special knowledge to just give it that extra thing instead of you know, trying to solve a, a project that is grown off the, the, oh, off the reel. Thank you. And anyone, uh, Alston or Stefan, do you care to comment? Well, I agree. I think the gap is, is closing and, and it's communication between the different groups is, is really important. And it's, and it's from my point of view, at least, uh, becoming easier, which I think is great. Huh. Great. All right. Well, so we've talked a lot, the, the session was theme was sort of democratizing, uh, the access to these data. And so obviously communication, uh, is a big piece of that equation. Um, I, I, I want to take it to the um, not not necessarily an either or again, but you know, sort of next step, most important uh, progress improvement. Would it would it be more folks doing something, doing daylighting simulation in some way, shape, or form? Um, would it be uh, some sort of software interoperability? You know hurdle that has just been giving us so much challenge that, you know, can, can Arthur talk to Autodesk or, you know, Revit or whatever. Um, and then the third uh, point of entry might be, is there an in a standard that needs to be more broadly applied either from country to country or um, even, you know, uh, more globally about sort of a daylighting goodness quotient? Um, and which of these, because I think we've been, all been working on each of these in various ways, which of these would you think is going to help move the needle um, most quickly? For democratizing. Can I jump in? Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh you can go. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, for, sorry, for this yeah. one, we'll do Stefan and then Alston and then the room. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think the the presentations today um, were a nice uh, mix, actually, of of sort of showing the needs of where things need to go, where there's. There is this need to have these simplified metrics, or I particularly appreciated the, the sort of regression analysis of sort of comparing that. And partly where I see my work is making that regression analysis more robust because you know it's based on something concrete. And then that all the detail that Alston's adding to, to their simulations and all those things, those go into to better informing these simplified metrics. I think where there's a gap is then with the, um, the step to, um, performance standards and metrics where we have something like daylight autonomy or these uh, climate-based daylight modeling metrics that were really developed in this kind of research context of like actually taking our understanding of daylight a little bit farther and that computing power just happened to get strong enough that we could then apply those everywhere. But at some point we can maybe pull back from that and look at what what's um, a simpler thing to implement um, that would really make it more accessible for everyone that, that's still representative. Um, and so that for me would be the, the big loop to close, would be to uh, really make sure your the metric development and performance standards are including this lens of how do we bring it back to something practical to implement without watering down what information is available. So the sort of link between software uh, metrics and performance standards. How about Alston? Uh, it's it's super challenging. On on one hand, a lot of you know new measures are kind of all assessing a similar thing, like what percentage of time do you meet illuminance due to daylight, and that's um, that seems straightforward enough. Uh, but on the other hand. Um, a lot of these calculations, from my point of view, are, are just kind of unrealistic in that, you know, should blinds be considered? Uh, and, if, and I would say almost always in like 99% of buildings, they should be. Um, how do you do that? How do you present that? And um, you know, I think LM83 took a really interesting and good stab at it. Um, we're trying to make it part of every calculation um, to illustrate the impact of dynamic shading. Mm -hmm. um, that's something to, to 
for everyone, I think, to kind of consider as we move forward. Sounds like metrics and software. Okay, how about a year <laughs> in the room? Thanks, Alston. I thought like it's easy for the larger firms to have interoperability, which is more about having you guys employed working the tools. You are the interoperability. And, but to democratize, we need the smaller firms, the smaller architecture firms, which are below 5, 10, 15 employees, which are maybe 90 plus percent of right. the world firms. They need interoperability. So it will have to come through not more softwares, but maybe the, the already existing software they use to have connection mm -hmm. to either prediction or simulation. Some kind of... All right. So I don't know if it's because I'm asking folks who are working on software development, but I haven't heard the answer is we need a better standard or we need a new standard. Does anyone want to advocate? I can give you that answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, uh, I think in Sweden we are a bit behind uh, because we still use daylight factor as the, in the building code. So, I mean, uh, daylight factor, in some sense, uh, it's hard to evaluate if it's really good daylight in there. It's just a minimum level that you've constructed. And I think the European standard takes that more in a focus. But I think another discussion we should have is uh, if, if the daylight demand should be applied for every room or, uh, and, and the way it's often applied now, it's like half of the room should apply. Mm. But can, couldn't we say that maybe half of the apartment should apply? So we can be able to dispense the functions of daylight more freely. Now we're rather, uh, we're sort of, the worst case scenario when using too much optimization is that every be building becomes the same. And if the daylight regulations are too strict and too set, uh, we sort of see that problem as well. But so, so that, was, that was what I would propose, to uh, make it more flexible, Very but good. keep the same level. I have a follow-up for that, unless you want to come in first. No, no. Okay, no, so, because this was a question from one of the audience members, nearly verbatim, something like, um, all this optimization is amazing, parametric design, and, and I think one of you mentioned parametric, you know, uh, parametrization of design uh, variables is not architecture, uh, but the, the question was like, well, what's the end game here? Is this sort of a fear of replacing the architect or the designer, and I'm curious if folks would like to comment on that balance, the tool versus the sort of uh, you know heavy-handed uh, guided, you know, Mikael. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of what I'm specialized in, and to be honest, it's definitely not to replace the architect, quite on the contrary, it's to give power to the architect to actually make sure that their design is doing the right thing, what they're trying to, to achieve. So it's really about empowering them and also to make sure that they're not run over by uh, engineers that just have one mindset that this needs to be fulfilled and then they don't may maybe care about the rest, or developers that, that have other agendas. You know, so it's really about empowering them to, uh, to make the right decisions. Good, and I, and I agree, and I think there is, but there is that tension, and I think we just all recognize that. So the, w the better, the more that we can empower the designers with information, I think, is, is the goal. All right, well, there's five minutes left in this Q&A, and I promised that we would get to hear some really geeked out questions from, from some of you to others of you. And, and in particular, I'm curious if anyone in the room would like to engage with our remote, uh, remote guests, Stefan or Alston, and ask them a really probing question. So. I don't know if very probing, but one question we get a lot from architects is, do you simulate trees in your simulations? Hmm. And it's a valid question. And we as humans, we will always go diver deeper and deeper because it's our nature to understand more complex, more complex phenomena. And you've done that. So have you done that just because you're curious and you had some overnight time to spend? <laughs> or because you believe we should model trees? And perhaps not every time, perhaps sometimes. Alston, maybe? I have perhaps an unhealthy obsession with accuracy in both daylight measurement and daylight simulation. So, it, you know, on one hand, it, it evolved from that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, trees are something that I think people associate strongly with daylight. And it's nice if you can provide some more information on, 
on how trees might influence a daylighting result or influence like a view or a glare calculation. Um, and so I, I really wanted to to make that that possible. And I, you know, as I go through my career, I find myself quantifying um, lots of different little edge conditions of daylight simulations that maybe aren't aren't paid attention to. So I, in preparing the slides for this for today, I, I thought, oh yeah, snow and and ground, changing ground cover and uh, why don't we why don't we do that? It's even in an, in an energy plus, you know, to change the ground reflectance, but not super common in the daylight simulation workflow. Well, I have to say, from an experiential standpoint. Uh, you know, paying attention to glare is one of my research areas, and that little mullion between the two panes of glass that <laughs> we don't even most of the time consider in our simulations often jumps out and pops you in the eye, or the parked car, or the the snow, or the puddle, right? And uh, these temporal, these external temporal variables, I think, are are fascinating, but it does make your mind start to melt a little bit with how much, you know, like, <laughs> where is the end of this? But all right, anyone else have a question for one of our virtual guests? All right, well, then I think we'll do a quick, a quick round robin, which is mm, we've, we're on our ninth symposium. It's too soon to say 10th because that's more defined and understandable. What you're working on right now, you'll probably present in the 10th. Uh, but maybe where do you hope we are in the 15th? Velux Daylight Symposium. So about a decade from now, uh, you, that's that's still optimism. It's at the edge of optimism, uh, and we have maybe 15 seconds each. So, redefining CAD, the computer-aided design, as not only the goal, the old-school AutoCAD thing, but as you sketch, having real performances indications. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. And I think, I hope that we uh, have found a way, maybe you could put on a good VR set or something uh, to communicate these results, because it becomes more and more complex every, every time this symposium is held, in a way. And uh, we need to find a way to communicate these results intuitively to the ones who are in charge of the design solution. So I think uh, I'm looking forward to that VR set. Excellent. Yeah. I hope that we can see people live. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be nice too. Yes. And uh, no, I agree with you guys. Uh, and we don't even know how computers look in, in that time. So allow the complexity to abound, Second. but make it easier to consume. Mikkel, yes. anything to offer? I hope to disrupt my own job, to uh, not be a simulation uh, guy in the office, but actually that the architects will take over and, and empower it. Wonderful. <laughs> and in our virtual space, uh, let's do Stefan. Um, yeah, well, this Daylight Symposium has two uh, simulation sessions, and I guess my hope would be that in 10 years we only need one or half of one, um, and that there's that we've learned enough that we can get back and focus on on kind of real world lived experience. Challenge accepted, and then Alston. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm hopeful that you know we'll be able to talk about the impact of the built environment and daylighting on you know. Some, some aspect of holistic well-being. Wonderful. And I think uh, that's it for our, this, this Q&A. Thank you so much. Yes. And you're going to take us to our next session? Yes, but please stick around and stick around, audience, because the next session, the third on this first day, is Daylight in Architecture. And we're going to have views, reflections, design approaches, and more projects from architects around the world. And they're looking at the best practices for daylight in architecture. So please don't go away. Sit tight, grab a coffee, and join us for the next session. Thank you.